Hey everyone, I'm Deb Goodkin and I'm the Executive Director of the FreeBSD Foundation. And thank you for joining us today for another introductory FreeBSD talk. So we started the series last year to provide a way for us to connect and for you to learn, especially during this pandemic. And we've done, I think this is gonna be our 17th or 18th um, uh, FreeBSD Friday. And um, if you have any topics that you'd like to hear about, please post those in the IRC uh, channel. Um, and also speaking of the IRC channel, um, if you have any questions during the talk today, uh, you can post it in the IRC channel and just proceed it with a queue so we know it's a question. Um, some of the upcoming events that I wanted to let you know about before we start, uh, there's a vendor summit happening November 18th and 19th, and um, you can you do need to register for it. It is free, um, but you we will post the link in the IRC channel. Um, the other thing that's happening now is we've officially kicked off our fall fundraising campaign, and um, this is time of year where we actually receive most of our funding. And so I'd like to ask if you like the work that we're doing, if you like uh, this advocacy and FreeBSD training that we're offering uh, to please consider uh, donating to our campaign. And if you work for a company that benefits from FreeBSD, then if you would help us by asking them to make a contribution too. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable, reach out to us too, and we can help you. So uh, today our presentation is The Writing Scholar's Guide to FreeBSD by Corey Steffen. And let me tell you a little bit about Corey. So Corey is a PhD candidate in the Department of Theology at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, with a specialization in uh, Catholic historical theology. He proudly makes exclusive use of FreeBSD, I'm sorry, free, <laughs> free and open source software tools to assist his historical research. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting and fascinating talk today, and I'm really looking forward to watching this with you. So now I'll hand this off to Corey. All right, uh, thank you, Ms. Goodkin. I appreciate that warm introduction, and I also appreciate being here. Um, I am proudly wearing a FreeBSD polo shirt, and um, it's. And I just wish to let everyone in the audience uh, who might uh, wish to, to um, let's say, do one of these in the future. I just wish to let all of you know that working with Deb, working with Ann Dickinson, working with Ed Mast, and uh, working. Uh, uh, also with uh, Joe, the new guy, he goes by JRM and IRC, has, has really been a delight. And um, it's, it's, uh, it helps put any stresses that might be there uh, at ease. So it's, it's great to work with them. And it's great to be here and, uh, and doing something completely different. So um, yes, uh, uh, as Deb said, the title for my talk today is the Writing Scholar's Guide to FreeBSD. And um, I'm I subtitle this a whimsical guide to using FreeBSD as a desktop OS for multi-source historical research and writing. So before I dive into the talk, let me open up share screen. All right, at this point, you should see the presentation and I should not have crashed. So let's get into the talk. All right, so in this talk, The Writing Scholar's Guide to FreeBSD, I intend to give a whimsical guide to using FreeBSD on the desktop with a special focus on historical research and writing. From building a portable set of dot files with ancient language legibility in mind to working with little known but powerful command line interface tools, I will explain almost everything that I have found to work best in FreeBSD for my unusual use cases as a historical theologian, that is, a scholar who works on the history of ideas inside Christianity. In the process, I hope to inspire fellow academics to become Unix geeks 
while showing more typical FreeBSD project contributors that your labors yield fruits beyond the server and enterprise usage scenarios that tend to dominate our normal discussion zones, such as IRC and the FreeBSD forums. Whether you are a newcomer to FreeBSD who might like to learn about using it as a desktop operating system, a Unix graybeard who is hoping to learn about tiling window manager usage for the first time, a FreeBSD kernel developer who would not mind receiving a metaphorical pat on the back for the hard work that you do, or someone who is otherwise interested in this internally consistent descendant of primordial Unix, you should appreciate at least something from what I am about to share. Before I begin, I wish to note that I surrender rights to the video recording to the FreeBSD Foundation for posting on the FreeBSD YouTube channel, perhaps elsewhere. I will make the transcript of the talk, that is my actual words, available on my professional website, coreystefan.com, shortly after I deliver it, entirely under a permissive Creative Commons attribution license, in the spirit of giving a BST talk, after all. Next, since this talk is going to be on YouTube, I wish to make shout outs to two YouTube channel operators whose work has inspired much of what you're about to see. The first, uh, perhaps more visible one, is Derek Taylor of DistroTube, whose many tutorials about optimizing workflows, chiefly in Arch Linux, have inspired much of what I'm discussing today about FreeBSD. The second is Christian, also known as RoboNuggy, R-O-B, uh, O-N-U-G-G-I-E, who is perhaps the only YouTube personality regularly making tutorials about FreeBSD desktop usage. If you are not already subscribed to RoboNuggy but would like to learn more about FreeBSD on the desktop, then you certainly should visit his channel. Finally, I note that I have learned most of what I know about FreeBSD from reading every single word on every page of Michael Lucas's Absolute FreeBSD Third Edition. I have a review of that volume in the most recent issue of the FreeBSD Journal, uh, which you can find on freebsdfoundation.org. The Reader's Digest version of the article is that, yes, Absolute FreeBSD is a complete success as a teaching volume. And in fact, I can see it as something that I might use in a hypothetical future classroom. It really is that good as a didactic resource. All right, with all that, let me begin. Perhaps it is natural that the sort of mind that thrives on piecing together minutia within one not computer related academic discipline tends to be different from the sort of mind that thrives on learning to use cutting edge technology. If all that an information technology team provides at a university or allows uh, at one's workstation is either bloatware from Redmond or spyware from Cupertino, avoiding brand name usage here, then one might fairly assume that nothing better exists. Each week, a typical ap academic must balance preparing lessons, lecturing, grading, attending meetings, and holding office hours, all while struggling to reserve blocks of time that are inevitably too small for personal research and writing. Now, the stereotype of the absent-minded scholar often holds true, I say while avoiding the mirror, not only because of our propensity for aloofness, but also because our workdays are disorderly by institutional design. Normally, the Frankenstein monster-esque computer setup that I notice while chatting in a windowless, book-filled office is only one piece in any particular scholar's chaotic work, uh, work life. With so much pressure to produce materials for publication, might, one might wonder, how can I possibly have the time to build a better computer workflow? Well, I think that we can. In fact, I think we owe it to ourselves to take that time, to set that time aside, to really consciously set the computer workflow that is best for us. No matter what the institution might provide, there's probably a better way of doing it. I think that all the traits that a scholar needs in a desktop operating system fit inside three broad categories, documentation, stability, and security. Scholars like documentation atop documentation atop documentation. If we cannot verify something for ourselves, then we are unlikely to trust it. This means that poorly documented operating systems cannot withstand the skepticism that is standard in the academy. Organization and documentation in turn go hand in hand. 
an operating system whose developers prioritize consistency is probably going to be intelligible for the person who takes the time to learn a bit about how it works. Good man pages, a clean handbook or guidebook, and a wiki that a dedicated user base actively maintains, this trifecta is the minimum of order that a scholar's operating system must have. Now, we scholars do not need the same kind of stability for our workstations as, say, FreeBSD.org needs for its servers, but we do need stability. Twice my Ryzen-based home-built desktop computer with 16 gigabytes of RAM has crashed because I was using over 13 gigabytes in one program to manipulate a high-resolution facsimile of a medieval manuscript. On another occasion, I almost entered cardiac arrest because an update for LibreOffice's Fresh branch rendered all of my work in progress dissertation chapters uneditable until I paused, took a deep breath, and realized that I simply needed to downgrade to LibreOffice still to avoid that really bad upgrade. Now, neither moment was pleasant to say the least. Scholars work with many long, complicated documents and databases, and our success depends on if, as few of those failing during crunch time as possible. If tools and scholars' toolboxes are not broken, we will not wish for anyone to try to fix them. Security, like stability, means something else for a scholar's workstation than it does for the kinds of environments that a system administrator or software developer probably has in mind. For a scholar, security means privacy. The best scholars share work with others for feedback and, and feedback and expect others to do the same. But we are also the sort of people who tend to be quite selective about who is or who is not able to see what we are doing. In other words, who those people are. Many academics work with entirely confidential materials. Think of people working in healthcare, for example, or per people doing research on data pertaining to academic records themselves. Any operating system that reports what its end users are doing to someone else or that can be hacked or monitored easily is not suitable for scholar scholarly work or probably any kind of work except learning to be a pen tester, frankly. Now, FreeBSD is not the only major open source operating system with superb documentation, stability, and security. We must never overlook our siblings in the other BSDs, for example. But it is undoubtedly one of the best. Information technology professionals often are the only people talking about FreeBSD. They, or you, I suppose, might not realize that many of the things that make FreeBSD fantastic for servers and embedded systems also make it outstanding as a desktop operating system or the writing scholar. The documentation and organization of FreeBSD are splendid. As a scholar particularly ever in search of historical documentation, trying to find order amid a diversity of ancient voices that often don't seem to have any order between them whatsoever, I find the internal coherency of FreeBSD to be downright refreshing. Even kernel building in FreeBSD, which is a terrible chore in many other Unix-like operating systems, mainly involves the use of human readable plain text configuration files. It is that simple. Things make sense because the people creating them aim for them to make sense. If you are already using FreeBSD, type man here, that is H-I-E-R, uh, man seven here, to see an initial explanation of why everything just makes sense. Namely, in this case, the fact that the system's file hierarchy itself maintains a tight logical ordering. Everything has its due place. That FreeBSD is tightly ordered holds true even down to the level of third-party packages existing in separate file directories from the system itself. Such separation helps ensure, among other things, that binary operating system updates from release to release are painless. I've seen this again and again, and you don't see it everywhere. Few people are going to question the stability of FreeBSD release versions, beside maybe some good natured rivals with the other BSDs who want to pick bones about who does binary upgrades the best. 
When the FreeBSD wiki lists certain hardware as being well supported, FreeBSD most likely will not be the cause of a system crash for anyone doing even very esoteric desktop work on that hardware. My system crashes that I talked about earlier were in a different operating system that runs in a hard to follow overall messy rolling release model. I doubt the same would have happened if I had been using a properly configured FreeBSD release system and the long-term service branches of my third-party software applications. Finally, FreeBSD is fully open and more than sufficiently secure for even the most sensitive kinds of work that we scholars do. With FreeBSD, we can trust that our intellectual property that we tend to keep close to home so, so, so much is not monitored by a suit at some hypothetical FreeBSD headquarters in Silicon Valley, and we can lock down our materials from the prying eyes of the rest of the world as much as we might need. I mean, FreeBSD even comes with three different packet fil filtering tools out of the box. Configure one and rest easy. No, you don't need to configure three. Just configure one, rest easy. At this point, I'm sure that at least a few of, her, a few of you are thinking, all right, Stefan, I see that FreeBSD has what it takes to be the backbone of my scholarly workflow. Great, but what should I actually do with it? After all, the busy scholar cannot afford to work without keeping as many tools for efficient research and writing in her toolbox as possible. And the operating system, as important as it is, is only the root tool that makes all the other tools work together the software equivalent of a motherboard in relationship to the other hardware inside a computer. Beside the operating system then, which of course should be FreeBSD, the window manager, I say, the window manager is the most important part of the historian's toolbox. For multi-source historical research and writing, the uses, use of a dedicated tiling window manager can improve efficiency quite dramatically relative to the use of a stacking window manager. A stacking window manager is what comes with all mainline desktop environments, including the good old FreeBSD standbys like XFCE, LXQt, Mate, and KDE. In that sort of setup, a stacking window manager setup, windows stack atop each other, hence the name, typically appearing on the screen where one's mouse cursor is when one launches a program. Although that functionality is actually somewhat recent in the whole history of window manager development. Most stacking window manager configurations involve the uh, using the mouse to drag windows around the screen. Lots then of clicking and dragging. This is the way that that I would assume that most people are, are accustomed to using a desktop operating system and working with applications in it. You open something, you click, you drag it, windows are atop each other, et cetera. In a tiling window manager, no windows are allowed to overlap and each window occupies all the screen space that is uh, allotted to it. Manuscript facsimiles, database query tools and other items that one might need to have open simultaneously in various windows are placed exactly where one intends automatically. And that's typically just by a few keystrokes. Tiling window manager usage tends to involve lots of keyboard shortcuts. Not much mouse, lots of keyboard. When launching applications and moving their windows, one's hands never leave the keyboard, in fact. There are dozens of tiling window managers available for the X window system. Generally, they can be placed inside one of two broad categories, manual and dynamic. Manual tiling window managers, which require the user to specify exactly where each window ought to be placed based on the exact key sequence that he or she uses, have, uh, have an advantage with regard to precision. Yet I have found that they tend to be too tedious for multi-source historical research and writing workflows. Dynamic tiling window managers, which position windows completely automatically, are both simpler to use and more efficient for the kinds of tasks that we historical scholars undertake. 100% accuracy of placement is less important for the scholar than being able to have a lot of windows open at one time without any overlap. Thus, I recommend a dynamic tiling window manager. As for which of the many dynamic tiling window managers is best, I must re remind my audience that probably consists uh, largely of programmers and system administrators, that most of us professionally studying history are not also well programmers or system administrators. 
or at a minimum, we are probably not proficient at the craft of coding. For that reason, window managers that require deep programming or scripting to configure are not viable. Indeed, the fact that so many tiling window managers require coding or scripting to use is one reason, according to my educated guess, why they are so much less popular overall than the major full-size desktop environments complete with their stacking window managers. It is, is it uh, more intuitive to set up XFCE, which feels almost exa exactly like old Windows XP or something that's quite familiar immediately, including the way that windows are placed, or DWM, for example, which requires an understanding of at least the absolute basics of the C programming language. XFC, of course. All right. Among the perfect, the many perfectly fine remaining options, then the ubiquitous I3 WM, that is I3 WM, and the lesser known Spectre WM, S P E C T R WM, which is, by the way, mainly built by some fellow BSD geeks. In this case, mostly OpenBSD guys, but I think some FreeBSD people work on it too. These two are noteworthy because they have human readable plain text configuration files. These files should be almost as familiar at first look for a historian accustomed to reading ancient lists in ancient languages, as I imagine that they are for a system administrator accustomed to editing FreeBSD's beautiful kernel configuration parameters. Remember, plain text configuration file, keep it simple. My favorite window manager overall, because it gets in my way the least of the several that I have tried, is Spectre WM. That is what I'm going to show today. During normal work, I use my laptop as an extension of my main desktop with the open source KVM switch imitator barrier, B-A-R-R-I-E-R, -R -E which you can find, uh, just go on to GitHub and, and search for barrier which allows me to seamlessly use the same keyboard and mouse with both. For this presentation, however, I'm going to keep everything as jitter resistant as possible by sharing screenshots of my desktop in a pre-made slideshow. No live demonstrations because that's, that's gonna be a great way to have things crash. All right then, let's get to the next slide. Oh, by the way, I just point out here we have Beastie doing exactly what I do. This is Beastie doing multi-source research and writing. All right, here is my blank Spectre WM desktop setup um, running uh, um, uh, as, as, it, uh, as it were. It, it could run uh, many Unix-like operating systems, but I built these dot files atop FreeBSD actually. Now, even on my 27 inch 4K monitor, I normally use multiple workspaces, sometimes as many as eight, nine. I've even used all 10. Um, so then let me switch the slide to show typical workspace two. I, in this, uh, if I were working right now, I would just do mod two to switch to workspace two. And then I would just type mod shift F and uh, open Firefox. And then I would get to my GitHub profile, which is where we're going next. All right, here's my GitHub profile. Historical dash theology. I spent years honing my workflow and learning the ins and outs of Unix-like operating systems before I finally built my own dot files from scratch. And so I call these theological dot files or theological dots. So the easiest way for somebody to find these, just if you're curious about using from for yourself, which is why I, the main reason why I'm showing my GitHub repository to you today is to go to github.com backslash historical dash theology. And then you can just click and enter theological dots as one of my pin repositories. So why do I call these theological dot files? As I say at the bottom of the fact, my frequently asked questions, I am a professional Catholic historical theologian and these dot files help me theologize. It's no more complicated than that. There's not anything, these haven't been blessed by a priest, these dot files have not. These are just, they help me theologize. Perhaps the most important thing within Spectre WM that I've found is that the Nord theme, a terminal and other computer user interface color scheme about which you can read at nordtheme.com, N-O-R-D theme.com. I, I found this to be extremely legible and easy on my eyes during long hours of pouring over materials. So that is what I use to an almost fanatical degree of consistency 
we academics tend to be perfectionists after all. In fact, you will see that my slides for today where there is text are completely Nord theme. <laughs> I couldn't make this presentation and not have the slides be Nord theme. The purpose of my .files repository is for me to keep my entire configuration in one central location, allowing it to function as my own easy to install desktop environment of a kind. I manage the repository with yet another .files manager, which runs atop and uses mostly the same commands as git. You can find this by going to yadm.io. This makes everything dead simple and it's available in every major Unix-like operating systems package report repository that I have found, including the FreeBSD ports collection. It's kept fully up to date there. So um, to clone these dot files within FreeBSD then, it really is just as easy as yadm clone github.com backslash historical theology backslash theological dots. That's it. That's all that you have to do to initialize the dot files. I built these dot files in and chiefly for FreeBSD, but I took care to ensure that they are that they fit with other Unix-like OSs. Because of FreeBSD's minimalism and strict standards compliance, POSIX is a general term. I'm not sure the extent to which it applies here, but maybe somebody will write that in the IRC chat. Anyway, because of FreeBSD's minimalism and standards compliance, it was almost the only logical choice for my for building my dot files to ensure broad cross compatibility. I like Arch Linux based uh, uh, distributions, for example, but the reality is that installing these dot files, even in a radically minimal setup uh, based based uh, in that camp can still cause headaches because they have their own non standard file locations and their own non standard system calls and so on and so on. So you end up, I, I, I end up, if, if I have to do that, I end up spending hours being frustrated, getting everything to look how I want. Whereas systems that are more standards compliant, above all FreeBSD, of course, where I set these up, but also Debian, GNU Linux, OpenBSD, these things these dot files basically just work out of the box. FreeBSD, of course, has a kind of primordial beauty to it that makes it especially useful for writing all dot files. And of course, once you've written your dot files in an operating system, you probably want to keep using it. So what I recommend to all the people listening to this talk today is that you choose FreeBSD or another quite standard compliant in, uh, oh, uh, Unix like OS, but FreeBSD and uh, write your dot files there. Just keep everything as tidy as you can for yourself so that when you go back and make changes, you can follow what you yourself have done. I love it. All right then, onto the workflow itself. The center of my workflow is the glorious triad of LibreOffice, Firefox, and the citation management tool Zotero, each of which I open with a quick, quick keystroke. So um, I set this in the plain text configuration file for Spectre WM. All that I have to do is type mod plus shift plus Z to open Zotero, mod plus shift plus L to open LibreOffice, and finally mod plus shift plus F to open Firefox. There are many ways to automate this in most tiling window managers, including Spectre WM, but I find that I like to open each application window on my own just a little less automation for the sake of being able to decide exactly what I would like to have running during a given study session. I do all of my writing in LibreOffice Writer, still branch, remember, stay to the long-term service releases for big complex projects. So all of my work in LibreOffice Writer, still branch with light text on a dark background, again, homogeneously Nord theme, so um, as an example, you will see the first page of my work in progress dissertation on the right hand side of the screenshot. So uh, you can see that everything, even down to the highlighted footnotes, which that shows that it's synced properly with Zotero, all of that is homogeneously Nord theme. And I have a translation that I've done to the start of a canon in honor of Thomas Aquinas. If you have any questions about that, feel free to ask in IRC. I use a variety of extensions for LibreOffice to help with spell checking, uh, to help especially with spell checking my various research languages. So here you can see just the list that I that I use at once. Um, 
uh, ancient Greek, uh, French dictionary, a German dictionary, a Latin dictionary. And I use all of these. I regularly change languages to each of these to make sure that what I've typed is correctly spelled and so on. Among these various extensions, I wish to give special praise to the ancient Greek extension. And this is one that not many people know about. Um, the reason why I wish to give it such special praise is because it has a wide array of really powerful, amazing features and great accuracy with the huge range of classical Greek that I need to quote, which tends to range from Koine or New Testament Greek all the way through even middle to late Byzantine Greek. Uh, it also handles obscure declensions in Greek throughout that whole range really well. It's able to, to tell me if I have an eta incorrectly uh, accented in the middle of words that are that don't arise in Christian Greek until the eighth or ninth century, and and how the tool is able to be this stunningly accurate, I don't even know. It kind of blows my mind. The only thing that I can say is that this is prepared by a very devoted. Um, digital humanist. And uh, so I, I highly recommend checking out this website um, that I have here shown on the screen and, and taking a look at that. If you do any sort of work with, with uh, classical studies or classical languages, this tool is excellent and it's not very well known. And of course, I have on the right uh, just showing that this is where you can get other LibreOffice extensions, is on the LibreOffice extension website. Now, it might sound obvious to use Fire Firefox, the web browser, is probably almost everyone here does, or else you might use Chromium for some benefits with, say, video conferencing software and FreeBSD or that sort of thing. But there is more to it when it comes to scholarship than simply using a stable open source web browser. Extensibility is what makes Firefox powerful for academic research and writing. I've had as many as 13 extensions and nine user scripts installed in Firefox on my desktop all of which I was using to assist my workflow. My favorite user scripts, um, which you can might be able to make out in the top right corner of this screenshot, uh, tend to be tweaks for the Brightspace Desire to Learn learning management system that my university uses, things like helping compress the gradebook view, which tends to be quite bloated and, and take up way too much screen real estate. So things like that really help for me as a creator. Uh, and, and uh, also um, um, uh, user scripts for things, um, you know, like handling YouTube videos that I need to watch or, or assisting with, with downloading large, large amounts of materials all at once, that sort of thing. I, I often will, will play between those. My favorite extensions for Firefox include Markdown here which uh, makes it so that I can write most HTML5 messages in plain Markdown. Really useful for being working in D2L and working in other class management uh, software places. Um, and, and because rather than having to mess with a with, with a messy what you see is what uh, uh, is what you get editing tool, I can just type it in Markdown and click one button and have it appear as I wish. Refined GitHub also I use to help me navigate resources on everybody's favorite Octo Octocat, aka GitHub. And, and um, the official Zotero extension uh, pairs my web browser with my citation management tool. Leech block uh, helps me stay focused on the task at hand rather than wasting time on multimedia websites, like watching Freebie Steve Friday when I should be working rather than working. Leech block is great at making sure that I watch Freebie Steve Friday over lunch. Zotero handles uh, Chicago style notes and bibliography or humanities citations quite well. The official Zotero extensions for Firefox and LibreOffice work together so smoothly, in fact, that occasionally I'm able to add an entry to my dissertation's running list of works cited from my home institution's library website in Firefox with one click and then actually cite it in the target location with one more. Otherwise, I might have to spend a few minutes, maybe 30 seconds with cleanup inside Zotero, but then I do not have to worry about the particular source being properly cited for the rest of the dissertation. Save odds and ends like dashes, semicolons, or italics, but that's it. Otherwise, the entire rest of the project is set. Here, I can 
both praise the FreeBSD project and make a call to arms for its members at the same time. This is with regard to LibreOffice and Zotero. First, the praise. It was not it was not an insignificant point of frustration for me for some time that the default package builds of LibreOffice for FreeBSD did not come with the Java flag, which is needed for most, if not all extensions, including Zotero. Doing a custom port build of LibreOffice only to have whack Java equals yes, and then needing to do package lock LibreOffice to avoid mix-ups mix up, mix ups while running upgrades that was not ideal. One day then I joined the FreeBSD desktop internet relay chat room in Libra.chat. I asked if we might add the Java flag to the package build by default. One of the main LibreOffice port maintainers, a fellow who goes by Fluffy, responded immediately that my reasoning was sound, that is that using extensions to support advanced workflows is a major part of why someone would need to use the whole LibreOffice suite rather than a lightweight or even terminal-based alternative. By the end of that same day, maybe even within half an hour, he had changed the settings that all LibreOffice package builds for all platforms would use the Java flag by default. So that is what I'm running um, now in my in my setup that uh, has FreeBSD. And it is how it is that, that I'm able to have Zotero running there and, and other advanced extensions, including the ancient Greek one. What this shows, of course, is that FreeBSD development takes place in a friendly, responsive community. Anyone can contribute. Simply by explaining that the Java flag is essential for any sort of advanced work in, in LibreOffice, since it is required for, for most, if not all, extensions, I was able to move, good old Fluffy, to change all LibreOffice builds in a matter of hours. The same would not happen in a humongous corporate environment or some such thing. FreeBSD is both more intimate and more collegial, and that's that's really to be lauded. Now, however, the call to arms. Neither Zotero nor Jabref, another open source citation management tool that has LibreOffice and OpenOffice integration, is currently available in the FreeBSD ports tree. I have spoken with another scholar who loves the BSD operating systems about this matter, in fact, and he agrees that the lack of either tool for any BSD so that includes um, OpenBSD ports and NetBSD's crop platform package source is a major hurdle to getting academics uh, like, like he, like myself and other people may be watching this to use BSD full time. So I am a part of a free BSD forum thread about Zotero in which we all collectively share information about how to best use the Windows binary inside wine. Uh, wine, window, wine means wine is not an emulator. Yes, Zotero runs in Wine well enough. It really does. Um, um, I recommend using the stable build of Wine that's in the FreeBSD ports uh, uh, system. And it still integrates with uh, a native installation of LibreOffice from Wine, um, especially now that we have the Java flag enabled by default. That, that does work together well. It's a, it's a good setup. However, it does not feel native because it is not native. And it is like most things in wine, both a bit slow and rather prone to crashes. That's not so good. Um, there is a recently expired port of Jabref. Um, it was expired, I think, only because of updates to Open JDK, the Open Java Development Kit, uh, for which the information is still online. You can still find it in um, the FreeBSD ports tree information uh, if you if you. Uh, open that that source uh, on the line, online. The reality, though, is that we need Zotero and or Jabref, ideally both to make BSD desktop usage compelling for researchers writ large. So if you are an industrious port maker and would like to help make FreeBSD a more compelling cell for the desktop, please consider doing one of the following, either make a native FreeBSD port of Zotero or resurrect the recently expired Jabref FreeBSD port or uh, I suppose do something like make a package source installation script for Zotero Jabref that uh, works uh, in FreeBSD or, or maybe write a Linux later build script or something like that. But a native build of Zotero and or Jabref would be best. And since I'm speaking on behalf of the FreeBSD Foundation, let me say this. The FreeBSD Foundation has an open invitation to apply for grants for projects that contribute to the good of the OS. So you can visit 
freebsdfoundation.org and click get involved for more information about that. I will tell you, um, I can't say any more than that since I don't work for the foundation, but I can certainly direct you there. All right, now then let's move beyond LibreOffice, Firefox and Zotero. Each scholar will need, will of course need to use his or her own specific research tools. I have found GitHub and GitLab to be the best places to search for them. I am specifically a historical theologian, which means that I study Catholic theology and history. Thus, I often run searches to see what kinds of utilities people are writing for theology, religion, history, history of Christianity, etc. in GitHub and GitLab. For anyone who might be interested to read what my favorite projects of that kind are, please feel free to visit the awesome theology list that I've pinned in my GitHub repository. So again, you can go to github.com slash historical theology, and then you can click this. This is pinned there as well. One of many things that is specific to my work is the need for aids for analyzing uh, different translations of various parts of the Bible. I use both graphical user interface and command line interface biblical studies tools, biblical study tools to help me do that work. For GUI, I use either Bible Time or Zephos, depending on whether I'm using a mostly Qt or mostly GTK setup respectively. And these days it's normally Bible Time since I'm normally using the LXQt projects GUI tools, which work really well in FreeBSD. At the core of Bible Time and Zephos are both GUI front ends for the SWORD project, which you'll see on the right hand side of this slide. The SWORD project is a huge very old, very well established open source community maintained project to bring a huge host of biblical texts that are available in the public domain and also biblical study resources to, um, to people using tools like Bible Times, Ephos, et cetera. So they use SWORD as the back end. So here I'm just going to show a, a sample use case of Bible Time. There really is nothing quite like having Greek, Latin, German, and English versions of a particular passage open in parallel for comparison with the ability to copy and paste any of the text. That all of this software is open source and all these texts are in the public domain being uh, made available by the SWORD project is in a word brilliant. It, it's, it's, I mean, it makes the work just come together, come to life with, without having to worry. Bible time is available in FreeBSD ports, of course. All right, I keep the CLI or command line Bible tools permanently open on my laptop during my normal workflow. So here you'll see that I have three CLI Bibles open, GRB or Greek Bible, which contains the full text of the Septuagint and the Greek New Testament. Uh, Vol, V U L, which contains the full text of the Vulgate Latin Bible, and KJV, which contains the full text of the King James Version English Bible. I keep a version of each of these three tools that I have modified very slightly by expanding the tar commands, just, just that, just expanding the tar commands, so that it works with BSD make instead of only gmake in my GitHub profile. So what you can do to, to find those tools is you can just go to GitHub Historical Theology and then backslash GRB, backslash vol, or backslash KJV, respectively. All you have to do then is clone those repositories, type sudo or do as, make, install, and then you're done with it. It installs properly into the correct directories and so on. And you can use these tools from the terminal. Now, it is important to note that not all terminal emulators are up to the task of handling polytonic Greek texts, so ancient Greek texts, or other texts with non-Latin characters. Among the several actively developed terminal emulators that I've tried, I found Alacrity, A-L-A-C-R-I-T-T-Y, to handle such um, kind of outside Unicode the best. Others are more hit or miss. And I really mean most others are more hit or miss, but Alacrity is a great, and Alacrity, of course, is available in the FreeBSD ports tree. I also make extensive use of William Whitaker's words, which is an old trusted Latin word parsing tool 
that is kept alive by a dedicated group of users and developers in one central GitHub repository, mk270 backslash Whitakers dash words. You can search. There are a few different projects actually I found um, available in GitHub for, for installing Whitaker's words. Um, you can install it in FreeBSD though. It's just a, a matter of making sure that you get the, get the one that builds correctly or one of them that builds correctly. And finally, I have various shell aliases on both systems to launch what I need automatically. So I use the fish shell, the friendly interactive shell, because it is well friendly. I understand, of course, why uh, lots of uh, system administrators and other people working with BSD operating systems prefer Born or the K shell or the C shell. Um, but I like that fish gets in my way the least. I like that it predicts what I need to do. And I just forget forget that the shell is there and it just lets me type the commands that I need. I'm not doing advanced scripting. So I actually don't need the full POSIX compliance with my shell, something that's unique to my work case. So for an example then of the, of the aliases or abbreviations that, that I have in FISH, if I need to open St. Thomas Aquinas's Opera Omnia uh, Complete Works, in the um, in, in the Elinks CLI web browser, hosted all hosted locally. I just type Tom, T O M, and that launches the Elinks browser, and it takes me to 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 this. <laughs> it takes me to Aquinas's Opera Omnia in the browser in my terminal, and that that's really useful. And uh, including parallel Latin and English. And you can clone a slightly clean repository of this, by the way, a slightly clean repository of Aquinas Opera Omnia, just called Aquinas Opera Omnia altogether from my GitHub repository. So what I did is I took the parent repository and I removed a bunch of unnecessary HTML so that it looks as clean as possible inside a terminal-based web browser. That's all that I did. And you can pull that down from my GitHub repository as well. For another great example of the use of abbreviations or aliases, if I need to open the freaking fast file system, that is FFF, no freaking is not its real name, but I cannot say its real name on YouTube. Direct, if I need to open this directly to the file directory in which I keep all of my dissertation documents, I type dis, D-I-S-S, it's that easy. So all together with all these aliases, a minute saved here, a few seconds saved there. And by the end of the day, I have saved enough time to accomplish a little task that I otherwise would not have been able to accomplish without saving those few minutes. Minus the fact that I'm required by circumstances at my home university to use Microsoft Teams for communication my historical research and writing software toolkit is 100% Libre. Moreover, it is highly efficient, not despite the fact that, but rather precisely because all of its contents are free and open source software. Being able to customize every piece of software in my toolkit means that I can make it my own toolkit. I can make them my own theological dot files and I can have it be my own desktop workflow. Everything then, I have specifically optimized for my own work. I proudly recommend FreeBSD for fellow writing scholars. Install FreeBSD, install the X window system, install a dynamic tiling window manager with plain text configuration like FreeBSD consistently uses, such as Spectre WM or i3WM, or else, or if you are not feeling quite so adventurous, a simple traditional desktop environment XFCE and LXQt both work out of the box on a huge range of hardware, including really old hardware. Install LibreOffice still and a decent citation management tool that integrates with LibreOffice and handles materials from your discipline. Again, Zotero runs well enough in Wine, and I have little doubt that this talk will inspire some hacker to get, get hacking on a native option. Install discipline-specific command line interface tools, the package system makes a good deal of third-party desktop software, simple and easy to install. And for all that, enjoy researching and writing with a logical, stable, and overall solid operating system 
your publishing schedule no longer will be subject to setbacks from your software. Rather, your software will work with you. That's the beauty of using FreeBSD, and that's the beauty of going entirely free and open source as a historical scholar. Thank you for listening. I'll now take questions. Okay, thank you, Corey. Let's take a look here. All right. Just give folks a few minutes to get their questions in. In response to Christian, aka Robo Nuggy, you are completely welcome for this shout out. And I wish that you will do a Free Beastie Friday soon. So there's a second shout out and a plug for that. Oh, such a sales guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. Oh, thank you so much, Corey. Um, I thought that was. I did think it was really interesting. There's so much that you covered and um, you know, I was trying to write some things down and I realized, and well, I actually really appreciated the fact that you're gonna post your transcript so uh, we could read through it because I think there was just so so much information in there. Um, and I, I just really liked how you shared with us. It's basically, you know, an application of someone's job or work and using and FreeBSD is the foundation and um it, but also when you ran into you know a few issues of of needing some software applications out there that you're able to approach the community and the ports maintainers for for that the software that you needed help with and how they stepped in and um and provided that support um, so that was that was great to hear and um and the fact that i mean we all i mean it really makes me think too about as i play around with my free bsd system here um that i'm running kde on right now and you know what applications um really could help me be more efficient in my job and and help so um so anyway so uh so thank you again and um i mean still if anyone has any questions um, I see that people are just talking, saying hi to each other in the IRC channel. It's great. <laughs> and, the, you know, and not only the shout out that you gave to these folks that advocate for FreeBSD and uh, provide great training uh, material, uh, but just talking about the community in itself and how it's, um, you know, welcoming and, um, yeah, I forgot some of the other things that you talked about. Just really, I think, um, oh, one thing you said was intimate and collegial, which I hadn't you know, really heard those terms in reference to the community before, but I think it's it's really true. And it's nice to hear that from others in our community. Um, so uh, with that said, um, our next, um, FreeBSD Friday right now, we don't have our, we, we have one plan. Um, but we don't have the official date yet. So we're working on that. And once we have that date, then we will publish that on our free BSD Friday page. And um, and actually we'll put that, I, I don't know if Ann had already put that link um, there, but that's also where you'll find the recordings of this talk, which will be published soon, as well as all the other talks that we've uh, done. And with that, I think that's it. And so, um, Enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Ms. Goodkin and the whole FreeBSD <laughs> Foundation. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Thank you.